Hello and welcome to Film Faves. I'm Justin Grohl. I am VTV's resident internal director and movie buff. Today I'm joined by... Finn Courtney. I'm a freshman and uh, good to be here. All right. Good to have you. Uh, so again, we're going to stick with one camera this time uh, for our Easter break episode. Uh, <laughs> a little behind the scenes, we're having some problems with some cameras. It's been, it's um, been a fun couple hours here. Been, uh, yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll... Get back to three cameras as soon as possible, uh, but it might be one camera for a bit. Uh, we'll see what happens about that. But just wanted to keep you guys in the loop. Uh, and, yeah, I'm not lazy. Uh, <laughs> it's just we don't have the equipment for multiple cameras right now. <laughs> um, all right. So hopping in the box office. Um, we're currently filming this two days after we filmed Jacob's. <laughs> so it's still the same box office, uh, but looking at dailies, um, it seems as though Dune and Kung Fu Panda are now neck and neck in daily box office. So it seems as though um, there's a bit of like back and forth jumping uh, between them. So mm. in the coming weekend, it might end up being Dune back on top because I feel like Kung Fu Panda might fizzle out actually because there really is not that much hype for Kung Fu Panda 4 because, uh, you know, people think it's not the best, but also it's not too Bad. You know, I'm kind of one of those people. I'm gonna be, if I'm gonna be honest, you know, Kung Fu Panda. I never watched one, two, or three. So. Really? Never Interesting. I don't know. Dune. I did the first one though. Loved it. Can't wait to see the second one. Thought my list of things to go do. But you know, I feel like overall more mainstream appeal. I feel like Dune just has that. If I'm being honest. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And Kung Fu Panda four. I feel like the generation that loves Kung Fu Panda has grown up now and are Dune fans. I would say. <laughs> That's fair. Like Kung That's Fu Panda, the first Kung Fu Panda came out in what, like two thousand eight, I would say. So I was in. I was like in this, mixed, this yeah. was this, this was like our generation, mm-hmm. and like, it isn't like Puss in Boots where I think it has the appeal for all ages. Right. Because like the art style of that was a big draw, and I don't know. I feel like Kung Fu Panda doesn't really have that compared. To no, that. Kung Fu Panda is still very much kid centric. It's very. It seems very kid forward, and it's it doesn't seem like it has any themes like as prevalent as the first three the first three seem that were very like theme heavy i'll take a word uh and number and the second thing when you cast aquafina as a sidekick you're not (laughs) gonna get a big box office because that's the same animated movie you get like six times a year that's yeah like that's it's the little mermaid you know uh even in live action movies like you got shang chi like I'll she's, tell you, she found her calling for, you know, just, low box office side characters, yeah. Which is interesting, because, like, I know that she was in an A24 movie that did, like, very well critically. And, like, I would love to see her go back to stuff like that instead of just being <laughs> the same did. character in every other movie. I mean, hey, money must be good, is all I'm going to say. Money must be good. Yeah, I mean, I recommend watching the A24 movie. It's called The Farewell. I mean, it's a great movie, and she's great in it. So, just a little bit disappointed that... <laughs> I we're now we're now getting just the same character. Yeah. Um, kind of typecast almost. But another th- uh, movie that might enter the box office race is the new Ghostbusters movie, mm. Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. Um, I've seen some reviews, and I'm a little disappointed as well at this movie uh, because it seems as though it's another man movie. Well, were you a fan of Afterlife or no? I enjoyed Afterlife. Afterlife was a good movie. And I trust that because it was made by the original director's and creator's son, right. Jason Reitman. And I thought he was working on this this one, but apparently he isn't the director of this movie. And now I'm not surprised that it isn't doing so well. Mm. Because what I've read is that it's, number one, mostly nostalgia bait. Number two, there's too many characters. I Apparently Finn Wolfhard has nothing to do with this movie, <laughs> even though he was a main character in the last movie. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, they went. it looks like from the trailer, at least when I saw it, they went back to the original characters a lot in this one, especially compared to Afterlife. Yeah, they, uh, when I heard Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson are the two main ones here, mm. Bill Murray, I heard, is like a cameo, mostly. Like, it's easy money for him. <laughs> but, I don't know. I, I was hoping for more. I will still go see it, because it still looks like an enjoyable time. But if I come out of it, and I, I'm just like... Eh, I won't be surprised. I did say one thing I saw a lot of was it expanded the lore Ghostbusters, which, I mean, 
it a good thing and a bad thing? I feel like people kind of torn on that. Like, I feel like Ghostbusters did have some really good, you know, mythology from the first one. I didn't know if we really need to expand it, what is it, four decades later, but... Mm. Yeah, um, from what I from what I know, I'm pretty sure, like, it's like all their ghosts have been released into the world again, <laughs> I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. James A. Caster's in it. Hopefully he's in it <laughs> enough, because that would be enjoyable. Um, Absolutely, I feel like yeah. Paul Rudd in it too makes anything enjoyable. Paul Rudd, yeah. Um, so moving on, uh, Warner Brothers, yeah, Warner Brothers, uh, they announced that they're making a Cat in the Hat animated movie. Yeah, Illumination lost the uh, rights to Doctor Seuss animated movies <laughs> after the Grinch. Um, so now Warner Brothers has control of it. Mm. And they are making a Cat in the Hat movie animated with Bill Hader. You know, I love Bill Hader. Uh, I remember live action Cat in the Hat. I feel like does have a weird place in my heart from childhood. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's a good or bad place, but, you know, definitely a place. And I feel like, you know, Bill Hader to me is good in just about anything. Yeah, so. Bill Hader's awesome in everything. What I was most surprised about. <laughs> Is the fact that on SNL Bill Hader played the Cat in the Hat in the sketch? I will say that was funny to me. And I, and I, when I first saw the announcement, I was like, "Oh my God, he's getting back in the Cat in the Hat costume!" And then I read further, and I was like, "Animated." And I was like, mm. "You could make it live action." Live action, I feel like might be better. Live action, I feel like would be funnier. Yes, <laughs> definitely. But I feel like they're playing it safe with animation. Yeah, probably. It's Warner Brothers too. I I can also see them potentially scrapping this oh, halfway like through a, development. A little back treatment just. Put it off on the have shelf another tomorrow. have another tax write off like Coyote versus Acme. I forgot, yeah, that one too. No. I really hope that one ends up coming out. Warner Brothers, man, because what can you do? I don't know. It's the fact that like so many people are in it and worked on it. Like James Gunn wrote the movie. <laughs> Anybody who's got the James Gunn movie out of their mind? Yeah, I don't. I don't understand. Um, it's kind of foolish. Yeah. Um, and then the other brief news. Um, this isn't really too much news as like I feel like rumblings have been said about this, but um Denis uh Villeneuve, or however you say his name, it's French. Uh but he has expressed interest in adapting the the second Doom book, Doom Messiah, to complete Paul Trades uh story. Mm-hmm. Uh however, it seems like he's gonna take a break from Dune before doing that. He might make another movie in between them. Uh, you know. He's he's made two movies back to back in the desert. I don't think he's looking to go back there as soon needs, as like, possible. You know, some ocean, some rivers, maybe you know, a little bit just, of body just just something, something less hot and sandy. Absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah. And I feel like it might be good, anyways. Just you know, not to give too much Dune fatigue. Like I feel like sometimes you do movies back to back to back quickly. You kind of run out by the third one. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all the news I had because there really still is not much to talk about. No, she did that with Jacobs too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we got to wait till closer to the summer, I feel like, before we start getting some big news. Because that's when they're going to start announcing things for the fall as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess there's one other thing. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, the second Beetlejuice movie, uh, released some set pictures. So we're getting our first look at that. I'm excited for that, if I'm being honest. I'm uh, excited. Love yeah. Renona Ryder. Love that Jenna Ortega is going to be in it. I feel like she'll be a great fit for that. Mm-hmm. And original Beatles Juice, I'm a fan of it. You know, it's not top 50 movie in my book, but I feel like it's a good movie. Enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy that Michael Keaton's getting back into comedy. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> should be fun to see him there. Um, I'm just worried because Tim Burton's more recent disog- like filmography is not... It hasn't been like a home run. More no. like... Not bad. Maybe, I think, maybe a single. I feel like after hmm, after Dark Shadows or Frank and Weenie, I think he started going downhill. Agreed. I think. Um, but yeah. All right, let's get into your your stuff. <laughs> so your your five your four movies um, were Booksmart. Books. Uh, that might be it. Yeah. The Godfather, Scream, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And the one we're going to talk about today, uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The five on there. Yeah, no, Booksmart, it's probably my feel-good movie. Like, it's rewatchable. I wouldn't it. say it's feel-good. <laughs> well, not feel... Uh, I mean, some parts feel good. I feel like the ending I love, personally. The ending's sad. The ending's... De- no, I mean, 
I'm happy that, you know, Caitlin Dever, I've got her name in that movie, gets off, you know, go follow her dreams. And I feel like, I don't know, I get enjoyment out of that movie more than sadness. Mm, okay. Like in my, inside, my little inside out brain, I feel like Joy's hitting the button a lot in that movie. Yeah, it's a funny movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, let's get into Star Trek here. Um, so I, I've always wanted to be a Trekkie. <laughs> like Star Trek seems like my niche. I've just never gotten into Star Trek. And so I'm happy that you put this on the list. Cause I, I got to watch Star Trek Wrath of Khan, a movie that like I know so much about, <laughs> but I've never watched all the way through. Mm. Um, and so let's just focus on you a little bit here though. Uh, get away from me here. Uh, why, why do you like this movie so much? Well, you know, me and Trekkie, I definitely characterize myself as one, you know. So, growing up, you know, I watched all the franchises, you know, Star Wars, Harry Potter. First one I did watch, though, was Star Trek. My dad is a huge Trekkie, so... First, first show I really ever watched was Star Trek The Next Generation. You know, a little Jean-Luc Picard action. Ah, some Patrick Stewart. You know, I love Mr. Patrick Stewart. And Wrath of Khan, for me, like... That movie is just, it's one I can always watch whenever, you know, any kind of emotion. I feel like first time I watched it, I was sobbing at the end. Not, I mean, you know, I'm, I like to be emotional in movies. It's definitely one that I feel for, you know, first time I watch it now, it's just like, I love it all the way through. I feel like it's a movie that's held up well over the years, but it being over 40 years old. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, like, even though it is like an eight, it's an early 80s movie, I feel like the effects are like so bad it's good exactly <laughs> because it it's not bad as so as so much as this nostalgic absolutely it just kind of like brings you back to a simpler time of sci-fi mm-hmm. where like things were just like they didn't have much to work with and so it just i don't know it just it feels very throwback nostalgic even, I feel like, for that time. Absolutely. It's not like, you know, I feel like nowadays movies like, you know, Spring Break, I watched The New Flash, which I felt was kind of CGI overload and not in a mm-hmm. good way. I feel like this one, you know, you can definitely tell, like, hey, the effects, you know, 19, what is it, 1982 came out back then. But I feel like, to me, it's, you've mentioned some of the time, definitely agree with that. I feel like, you know, they're not the best, but they still, they're still enjoyable. Yeah. And, like, not all the effects are bad. Any shot outside of the ships, like just seeing the ships in general, are so well done. Mm-hmm. Like they, you can jet, you can really like, they feel real. It's more so the stuff like, <laughs> like people getting beamed up, or uh, <laughs> my favorite thing that is just simple effects is is practical. Just any time that the ship gets hit. <laughs> it's just a small explosion <laughs> in the same, like, five places. <laughs> <sighs> that has benefited doing models, you know, because Star Trek, for until, like, mid-late 90s, they used models for all the ships rather than, you know, CGI them in. And I feel like they look, the ships themselves look good, but definitely any CGI, like, explosions. Well, yeah, I'm talking, like, inside the ship as well. Like, anytime the oh, bridge, the actual- anytime <laughs> they get hit on the bridge, it just, an explosion happens, and they're like, alright, we're good. <laughs> Little ship shake, yeah. yeah. No, like, absolutely. I feel like it's definitely a simple time effect. Maybe ones that, you know, aren't as stunning and as practically good as we have nowadays, but to me, you know, it's nostalgia. Yeah, it, it's nostalgia, because, like, it's based on when did Star Trek? Star Trek was a 60s show, right? The original was... 60s, 70s? Late 60s. And, you know, only went three seasons. They did one movie before that. Yeah, it's so amazing yeah. that it was only three... And it's held up to now. Like, it's still going, which Like, it, it's, became, it's become, like, a mega franchise. The phenomenon, Like, yeah. there's, like, ten... Well, ten plus movies in, like, I think the general... Like, the actual timeline. Mm-hmm. And then you got the J.J. Abrams stuff that came out. Yeah. And then you got... The shows. Like, all the shows coming out in Paramount it's now. It's like, I think Paramount has, what, three, four shows we're on it right now? Well, it's got Trek? Picard, Lower Decks. Discovery. Discovery. And there's one, there's one more. I think that's it. Oh, Strange New Worlds. Oh. Which went back. It, it, it's like a prequel to Kirk a little bit. So Yeah. Um, yeah. Something that was interesting when I was watching this is, like, the original, like, shirts, like, the colored shirts are just so iconic. Mm-hmm. And it was just so interesting watching this, and they're all in the same red suits. The Monster Maroons, as they're called. And I was just like, <laughs> like, they looked good. 
but part of me was like disappointment. I was kind of like, where's Spock and Blue? Where's Kirk and Yellow? Yeah. So the films, the uniform wise, I do find it funny because you know they had the original, you know, red, yellow, blue, and then they made Star Trek the Motion Picture before Rathcon, which which I heard is god awful. <laughs> it's how do I describe? It's visually stunning for its I time. I assume so. But it's it's Star Trek the slow motion picture if you watch it. Because like what what I know about Star Trek the Motion Picture is like you skip it. Because yeah. it is nothing like the show. No. Like, they completely deviate from, like, the feel of the show. Like, the characters are all totally off. And that's why they made Wrath of Khan yeah. so much to be like, all right, we messed up. Here you go. <laughs> it's like, here you go. We're sorry. Here's a all time great right here. Yeah. Enjoy. I mean, this is great. Um, and I think what's so great about it is, like, even though it is a continuation of the show it can still be watched on its own. Mm-hmm. Maybe not so much with the same impact as if you watch the show. Because, like, Khan is a villain from the show. Yeah, but the funny thing about Khan is, in the original, he's in one episode. He is in one episode. That's but, it. Yeah. But, like, they bring him back, and then he became, like, an all-time great. Yeah. Um, like, Culture Montalban, I think it is an iconic role for him. You mean the grandfather from Spy Kids? <laughs> <laughs> he was, oh, my God. Oh, I always forget the Spy Kids. Yeah. <laughs> Our little, you know, wheelchair running around grandpa. Yeah. Well, until he gets the space pill and is running around the moon. <laughs> I, I, game, I try to put Game Over out of my mind, if I'm being honest. Game Over? What? I'm a big Spy Kids 2 fan. That to Spy me, Kids 2 is great. Spy Kids 2, is, I feel like that's peak. And I feel like, you know, Game it's enjoyable. It's not on the level of the one that became for it. But Spy Kids 3 is just so iconic. <laughs> I mean, talk about effects. Like, I that mean, is bad, bad as it you, gets. you got the guy. The guy. Elijah Wood. You by got way, Sylvester Stallone playing four different characters. Yeah, by the way, the guy, you know, Elijah Wood, like, a couple of years after Lord of the Rings, which just makes me laugh every time I see it. It's like, you know, Elijah, you did Lord of the Rings, but here, here is the all-time role right here. It's A five-second clip of you dying. <laughs> um, yeah. Glenn Powell's in that movie, briefly. Glenn Powell's in that movie? What? <laughs> He's the one who's running the robot fights on the moon. <laughs> it's very interesting. What? Oh, my God. I need, I need we'll, we'll, watch put, we'll put the camera, we'll put the picture up here, okay. but that's Glenn Powell. Um, <laughs> but let's get back into Star Trek. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you got, like, some alt- you got iconic characters. You got Kirk, Spock, Bones, some new additions in there. Mm-hmm. You got um, Savick. Savick, yeah, the, the, new, the new girl. Uh, is, is, uh... Sisu, is that his name? Sulu. Sulu. Is, yeah. Was he in the original show? He was. Okay. Because, I, cause like, I know George Sakai is, like, very iconic in the Star Trek universe. Yeah. I just didn't know if he was introduced here in, in the no, show. No, he was in the original series. Sulu. And George Sakai kind of hates William Shatner, so they kind of deviate I mean, past. I think a lot of people do. It's, I've, it's, I've, I've heard it's he a was fair a, opinion. I heard he was a diva. Um, but, I don't know. Th- this movie was good. I enjoy. I What I enjoyed about this more than I think Star Wars, it felt much more like a chess game than Star Wars, mm-hmm. which I think like you can probably agree with. Absolutely, like Star Wars feels very much like action figures. Yeah, and Star Trek, I feel like you know it's a little bit more of a mental, like it's almost like submarine warfare at some point. In the a hundred percent. Yeah, like that's exactly how I felt in the final battle. Mm-hmm. Like no visuals, and it's all just piling. To me, that final battle, Michelle and Nebula, I feel like it's probably it's probably my favorite battle in any movie, just about. Even though it is maybe not visually stunning like more recent ones have, but to me, sci-fi wise, it doesn't get much better than that. Mm-hmm. It's a great battle of strategy and Absolutely. a mental game, and also just throughout the whole movie, it's Kirk and Khan kind of mm-hmm. one upping each other in. And strategy. they never meet, which is be- which is the best part to me. <sighs> I wish they did, though. You wish they... Oh, that's, that's interesting. No, I love that it's all, you know, visual through view screens and that and not just actually meeting, because I feel like Star Trek loses it when it goes physical action almost, but... Well, I agree. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, of, one of the funniest parts in this movie is when David, uh, Kirk's son, is, a, is fighting Kirk, <laughs> and William Shatner... <laughs> Who <laughs> does not look physically capable to take on this very young and this muscular like guy. guy? This yeah. nineteen-year-old who is clearly buff, and you just have short William Shatner <laughs> just taking him down. Oh, and I laughed at that because I was like, William Shatner, you're not winning this fight in real it, life. It, Star Trek, it, it has a theory of like just bad, like in the original theory of Star Trek, like there's one like very infamous thing. It's like Kirk and the random planet was this big green alien guy. I've seen the this. Gorn. Yeah, it, it is. Hysterical. Yeah. 
but like again, I feel like even in in that times, it's still a strategy in absolutely. Um, and yeah, that's what I that's what I really like about this movie. I'm. This is my episode. This is your episode. I'm. <laughs> so let let's go in. Like you you mentioned, like your favorite battle is uh the the, ne- the nebula one. Yeah. Like, are there any other like scenes that really stand out to you in this movie? And I think I I have an idea of what you might say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. In, okay. Uh, one that very much stands out to me is when Kirk takes back command because I feel like you know. In the, in the original theory of the Star Trek, it's all, you know, Kirk is the leader. And this one, in the first, like, leg of it, he's, like, it's like a backseat to it. And, you know, it's not really a half backseat. It's, like, you know, accepted it. I'm old. Like, I feel like the movie definitely, I wouldn't say coming of age, but it's, like, you know, it's them dealing with, you know, they're older. Like, Kirk dealing with his own mortality, I feel like, at times. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it reinvigorates him to, you know, get back in command. And to me, that is a great scene. I feel like the first scene, the fake out of, you know, in the first ten minutes, you're oh like, yeah, when you when you're like Spock's dead, yeah, which uh, hysterical move because what happened in the end of the movie, but <laughs> it just it stands out to me as like a very good pickup by, by you know the team behind this. Yeah, uh, th- what were you I th- thinking? So I, I was thinking of the other Spock's dead scene. Oh well, <laughs> I mean I feel like that one is just like it's it's one that I feel like goes that thing almost, but it's probably the most iconic scene in this movie. Obviously, yeah, but uh, well maybe not. Most iconic oh, scene. Con. Con. Yeah. Con. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I feel like definitely, though, they've hit that emotional peak perfectly with Spock's death. Like, you know, it's self-sacrifice. It's a beautiful friendship, seemingly coming to an end. Mm-hmm. But, well, seemingly. I, do say, I will say they tease very much that, oh, you know, sorry, Spock's actually not dead by the end of it. Yeah, but. they do. Like, that's... It's something that I feel like is hampered by the fact that we're so far removed from the time that this came out. Yeah. That, like, I feel like if I watched the show first, maybe the death would have impacted me a lot more. Because Spock isn't in this movie that much. Like, Spock is very much, like, a lot of this is focused on Kirk and Sis... The, 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 the oh, new girl. Savick? Savick. It's a weird name, I know. Savick, it, a, yeah. yeah. The, the movie's very much focused on their journey together. Mm. And, like, Spock is kind of removed from it until the end. And it's like, oh, Spock. Like Spock. And yeah. then, like, knowing the fact that the next movie is literally called the search Star Spock. Trek Three: The Search for Spock. <laughs> <laughs> and spoiler, they, they found him. So they, they found he, him. He found him. Uh, but, no, I feel like just that ending scene, it's, I know, people criticize William Shatner's acting a lot. I feel like that might be his finest work in that, like, final mm-hmm. 10, 15-minute stretch. I feel like the funeral and his little, like... I want to say, ep- like, epilogue. Like, like his reconcile with David, definitely. Definitely. And then the little, like, speech he gives on the bridge when, you know, they're watching the planet come up at the end. Well. <laughs> what? You were you didn't like that? I couldn't help but laugh a little bit around that scene because it's, it's Spock's send-off. And you have Scotty in the back doing the bagpipes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. You gave the one <laughs> Scottish character bagpipes? <laughs> I was like, no. It, it, it's almost just too funny. It, I was laughing. Uh. <laughs> Sadly. It, it, if you ignore that, it's a very powerful scene, but I see why it takes away from yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then I love just the final end is just the iconic, uh, you know, Space, the final friend, yeah. like that whole thing, mm. like it, like that gave me a little bit of chills. It's just, it's iconic, and mm-hmm. it's iconic for a reason. It's just Leonard Nimoy is perfect. What else mm-hmm. do you say? Yeah, I mean, Spock's whole speech in the end, as he's dying, is just iconic. I would say that interaction between Kirk and Spock. Yeah, no, I feel like like there's so many great lines. There, it's just you know, obviously you have been and always shall be my fr- or other way around. I have always been and shall be your friend. I feel like it just. It's just so touching and powerful, and it's a real moment. And in Star Trek, I feel like sometimes you get bogged down in techno babble and all that, but it's a real emotional moment here that I feel like in any movie just it stands out to me. It stands out. Yeah, and then you get like Spock also saying something that was reiterated at the beginning. I think after the training exercise, is he was I think he was either talking with Kirk or with what's the suit. Sis, oh, dang it, <laughs> Sla- Savic. Savic. I can't. I can't with that name. Um, but at one point he mentions in the movie, and he repeats it as he's dying. 
the needs of the oh, many, the needs of the many outweigh the needs, the needs of the few, of the few and then the actually, one. So, fun fact about that line, earlier in my modern class, I actually used that to, you know, get a point out. And I'm like, wow, oh, a little Star Trek reference for me. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's a statement that I feel like works in Star Trek, but also works in so many other respects. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, obviously, probably the most iconic line in all of Star Trek. Live long and prosper. Yeah, live long and live prosper. Long. Put Putting that up to the glass is yeah. just such a... It's just so great. Ugh. No, and that line is definitely, I feel like if you had to pick one line that identifies with Star Trek, it's that line. It's that line. It's either that or Space the Final Frontier. Well. Or Khan. <laughs> <laughs> William Jodner's finest moment right there. Uh, oh, no. And perfect GIF, I will say, in any tech situation right there. You say GIF? GIF. I say GIF. You okay. Say GIF? Oh. oh, well. Oh, oh Justin. Oh, no. <sighs> we, oh, no. <laughs> it, 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 it's Jeff. It's Jeff. Um, it's like, you know, the peanut butter, like Jeff. That's a J. That's spelled with a J. Yeah. GIF is spelled with a G. Okay. Well, mm, moving on. Yes, yeah, moving on. <laughs> so, um, something else that's interesting is that in, like, the J.J. Abrams universe, they've kind of, they're kind of, like, redoing, they kind of, like, started going along the lines of redoing the movies, Oops. and then they made Star Trek in the Darkness secretly Wrath of Khan, with Benedict Cumberbatch being the twist villain, with the awful line, I am Khan. Here's my thing about the J.J. movies. It feels like he's trying to, like, rub his Star Wars itch six years too early. Like, I feel like he wanted to make Trek into like a Star Wars kind of, not even rip off, just like Star Wars light and those movies they're popcorn movies, they're enjoyable, but I can't stand it in a darkness. It's probably it's a bottom ten movie of all time for me. Mm, I will say like the cast is pretty good. Like Chris Pine, I think he's an iffy Kirk. Chris Pine uh, but, but I will say Zachary Quinto is Spock. Exactly. He's Zachary perfect. Quinto as Spock is great. I think just having Zoe Saldana on the ship, having um John Cho and uh and Carl Urban as Bones, I, th- I feel like is great. He's a gem in anything. Mm-hmm. I feel like just like that's just like a great all-around cast for it's Star Trek. It's a great Trek. cast, but I feel like it's let down by just I feel like you know the first JJ Star Trek. It's 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 good. It's enjoyable. You know you have Leonard Nimoy making a cameo in there that I think it really works. And then Inner Darkness. I remember seeing Inner Darkness. I was like second, third grade, and I and I walked out of it being like, and I'm with my you know my old man. I'm like, hey dad, isn't that just Wrath Khan? Yeah, which you know it is, but not done as well. I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know in Into Darkness, they changed the ending, it's, it's and they so have dumb. Kirk be the one <laughs> to sacrifice himself. Have you seen Into Darkness? No. Okay, here's how they undo that one. They don't even make a search for Kirk. Like the next movie, like you forget all about that because you know they have Kirk make his emotional sacrifice, and then 20 minutes later, he's revived with magic blood. Magic blood. It might be my. It, it it's you know it's the some, somehow Palpatine returned to the Star Trek universe in my opinion. Somehow, Kirk returned. <laughs> it's just, uh, and, and you know, to me, I feel I've seen the people how like you know dampered the original their love of Rathcon because of that movie. For me, I kind of just ignore it. If I'm being honest. Yeah, just ignore because like it was made way after, it's and like, it was none of the same people. New. No. Like yeah, you can definitely remove it's just, that. It's silliness at a yeah. certain point. Um. So of like the the cast here in like this first in Wrath of Khan, yeah, the first iteration of Wrath of Khan, um, Wrath, Wrath of Khan Part One should be the villain part, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, who is there? Like, any character here that like you really enjoy watching? So many. I feel like enough. I, I'll. That's the thing I've talked about Kirk enough. I'll, I'll go to Savick. You know, your favorite impronounceable name. Savick, uh, Savick, Savick. And Savick, it's. The problem with Savick is the next two, they recast her with somebody else. Cause, oh, they do? So, Kirstie Alley, you know, big star, went on to Cheers. Well, yeah, this is her first, f- first role first in role. anything. And, and, you know, they tried to get her back for the next one. It's like, any more money? They didn't give it to her. And they gave it, I don't even remember this woman's name, but she played it so tonally off and just, like, completely the alternate of Kirstie Alley. And it, and it killed the character pretty much. It just So, in this movie, I feel like Savick's almost, you know, the audience's POV. Like, you know, mm-hmm. she's... The new one, she's pretty much taking over for Spock, and if they actually held to Spock dying, it would have been interesting to see what they did. I'm glad they didn't do that, but... And I feel like she just did a great job overall, you know, the whole thing when they're down on the planet with Kirk, Bones, and Kirk's son, and... I forgot her name. Carol. I, Carol. I just thought it was very interesting, actually, in this movie. Like, just being like, 
I'm so proud to be your son. I was like, oh. A little bit wooden. That makes sense. <laughs> like, throughout the movie, I didn't realize that. I, like, kind of, like, they hinted at it. Oh, you didn't that, put it together? I mean, I did. But, like, they never outright said it. And I was like, oh, I'm just thinking that. It's an interesting twist. And I, I, yeah. <laughs> And it's, no, but for me, Pasavic, I love in this movie. I feel like, and obviously Kirk, so much in this said about his role in this. I feel like William Shatner, you know, is he hammy? Is he a little bit campy? Absolutely. I don't think he was too much in this movie. But not in this movie. That not in this is, movie. This movie, he felt very grounded. Absolutely. And I feel like his, you know, little arc from being off the ship and just, you know. Being like this, like, mentor role, hopping right back in. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he's rejuvenated by the end of it, which... I think it's a great arc. Great yeah, arc. I think so. And, you know, on another note, not character-related at all, I do want to say the score in this movie is fantastic. Yeah. Like, James Horner, he went on to do Titanic, Avatar. It's just phenomenal. I will say it felt very, the score felt very John William- Williams-y. It felt very Spielberg-esque. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this feels like a Spielberg movie a little bit currently. And that might just be the fact that the last two Spielberg movies I watched were E.T. and Close Encounters. <laughs> So I kind of like have the they kind of mash together. Yeah, but no, it's just it's probably one of my favorite scores in film. I feel like it's just so well done, and the little like ending from Spock's funeral to the credit. I feel like it just it's it works so well in it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, personally, I feel like my like other than like Spock, like Spock is just iconic. I really enjoyed Bones in this movie. <laughs> I, f- I didn't expect Bones to be one of my favorite characters, but he ended up being one of my favorite characters. thought that was interesting. Well, I feel like also, you know, Kirk, Spock, Bones, they have such great chemistry between the three of them. And <coughs> dying over here. Uh, and Bones, I feel like in the movie, he, it's, he's, his wit and just sarcasm play so well off Shatner and off Nimoy. And it just, it's, you know, kind of underratedly great. Yeah. I mean, it's cl- like in this movie, you can clearly tell like they have been through a lot together. Absolutely. And they are just like old ch- Like even in the, pl- even in like how they strategize, like they don't have to communicate fully. They're both, they're, everyone's on the same page yeah. at the same time. Like you have uh, them speaking in code when they realize that Khan is listening in and like no one else knows this. <laughs> And then, like, you have... Even Savick doesn't, you know. Yeah, Savick doesn't. It kind of reinforces her being, like, the audience of POV in this, I feel like. You have when, like, they take down Khan's shields from their own ship. And, like, him and Spock are on the same page. That is one of the funnier movies when, you know, Kirk pulls out his glasses and then he realizes everybody's looking and he's like, damn. And it just, it... it, And it kind of goes back to his whole, like, you know, dealing with his age and mortality thing. But it is... I mean, yeah, because... A little fun riff. Yeah, death is a big part of this movie. Absolutely. Because, like, the whole purpose of Khan's vengeance is the death of his wife. And then you have the opening where uh, you have the training exercise leading to death. Where they all die. And, and like, having... Yeah, and, like, having to decide how to handle death as much as life. And then you realize that Kirk hasn't faced that at all until Spock dies. Mm -hmm. The whole Kogashi Maru subplot with Savik, I feel like, is one that's been talked about a lot, but I feel like it's still even now underrated. I feel like just her, you know, realizing that, you know, oh, wait, Kirk never faced death, and just, you know, he cheated death, and Spock being unable to do that to save everybody, I feel like, mm-hmm. works well. Yeah, I loved, I love Spock's sacrifice. I mean, it's so, so well done. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I... <laughs> I love the little trick he does to get bones away. <laughs> it's like, look over there, <laughs> Vulcan neck bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, Doctor. No, he's trying to explain it logically. Just look over there quick. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, look over there. Uh, I also feel like Spock feels very, very human in this movie. He feels very less Vulcan. Like, he still has his Vulcan tendencies, I feel like. Mm-hmm. But, like, he feels, like, looser. Like, he, it feels like he's able to joke a little bit in this movie. Yeah, and especially, you know, comparing him in this movie to him in the original show. I feel like it's an interesting just, yeah, cause you know, in the universe, I feel like about 20 years pass in between. And it's an interesting just, you know, evolution of his character mm-hmm. that, you know, going from this very one, very straight role to, you know, actually being almost human. And I think, and that's, I think it's a necessary one for the ending. For sure. Cause like, if he was like just his stern self, I feel like he wouldn't be able to give that monologue. And that whole end. friendship arc would kind of be lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, anything else you want to talk about here? I, I mean, well, for me, it is my favorite movie of all time. And I will say it kind of always has been. I feel like it always will be. And it just, Trek's always been my, like, number one thing, in, be it film, television, whatever. I've always been a huge Trekkie. And for me, it's one of the first movies I actually ever saw. So it's a it's a very special movie to me. I know some people might see it as, oh, it's older. Oh, it hasn't held up well. But for me, I can look past that and just look at, you know, to me, it's fantastic. I just I feel like it's held up very well, actually. Like, this is still regarded as one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. And I think rightfully so. I feel like I just watched a video of, like, Kevin Smith's top five sci-fi, top five, like, mm-hmm. sci-fi movies. I know this was definitely on that list. For sure. Um and I feel like any Star Trek list you look at, it's Rathacon 1. And Rathacon's always going to be 1. Yeah. I think probably after that, what do you have? Uh, the last original series one, it's called The Undiscovered Country. That was, it's a really good one. It's, it's very different from this movie. And I feel like, you know, then they go on to Patrick Stewart and his cast. They have four movies, and they only hit on one out of four, in my opinion. But oh, the isn't there that, one called, like, The Voyage Home or something? The Voy- Oh, it's The Whale one. Uh. It's... That one, it's that one. They definitely show off comedic chop more than anything else. It's like they go back in time to save the future, and it's definitely more camp than this one. A lot less serious, but it's it's great. It's the the robot Star Trek is the even ones are always good. So you know, Wrath Khan was two, Voyage Home was four, Undercover Country six, and then the only good one, Patrick Stewart, is the eight one or the eighth one. So it's an interesting little. Where does Generations fall? I know that one. That one was like kind of like a passing of the torch, somewhat. Generation, like, uh, I just I actually just watched it a couple months ago, and it's one where, you know, they have Kirk cross over to the new cast, and it definitely, it is a passing torch moment, but... Like, even though, like, the new cast has been going, it feels like, all right, finally, Kirk... It's not, I, it's, it's interesting, because they make... Because I know, I know what happens to Kirk in that movie. They, they kill Kirk in that movie. <laughs> they kill Kirk, yeah. Which, by the way, you know, it's, it's fine enough, it's a good movie, it's enjoyable, but the decision to kill Kirk, I feel like, is... A swing and a miss by them. I feel like they didn't need to do that. It like might have been William Shatner's choice. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's William Shatner's choice. I feel like he would never die. But yeah, well, I feel like maybe this might be his 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 Harrison Ford Han Solo moment by being like, if I come back, I have to die. <laughs> it might be. I am not doing this again. <laughs> and to his credit, William Shatner did never come back to Star Trek. After no, he movie. never did. So um, interesting. Still riding the high of it though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ninety three year old still kicking. God bless him. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace, Leonard Nimoy, though. No, that, a sad one. But, I mean, out of the British cast, I feel like, you know, Shatner's alive, George K's alive. Yeah, George K's still down. <laughs> that, that might be it. Actually, oh, no, Chekhov's alive, mm. who's kind of background in the movie, but has some good moments. I mean, he has an important role he in this movie. He has an important role, but... But, like, he's he's sort of like the Hawkeye of this movie, of, like, the Avengers, where he's... That's fair. Where That's he's being controlled by the villain for most of the movie. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he comes back and has a nice little moment at the end. He's kind of like, do you need someone on torpedoes? <laughs> and that's it. It's like, hey, I can shoot arrows. You want me? Hey, uh, pew. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It, just, it just, I love this movie. Yeah, I feel like this is a very, very good movie. I feel like there's something else I want to talk about. Oh, well. Oh, yes. Have you ever watched Galaxy Quest? No. Okay. Watch Galaxy Quest. It's a parody of Star Trek, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a lot of fun. I will say I haven't seen that. I have seen Spaceballs, which Spaceballs. That's a Star Wars parody. It's it's Star Wars, but it's a bit of Trek thrown there if you see it. Yeah, but Galaxy Quest is all it's all Star Trek. Star Trek because it's about basically. Imagine if the cast of Star Trek got back together for like reunions now. <laughs> like that's all they did. They kept riding the high of it. <laughs> And they were just now washed up actors. But then all of a sudden they learn that their show has been historical record for aliens. <laughs> no, I will put that it, on the list. It, it, it's, it's so much fun. It's Tim Allen. It's oh, well, uh, Tim Sigourney Allen. Weaver. Alan Rickman. Alan is Rickman? Ba- Alan Rickman's basically the Alan Spock. Alan Rickman in a Star Trek parody? Oh, what? He, he, oh. He's so, he is basically the Spock of that movie. Oh, man. And it's so much fun. Alan Rickman in anything is good. I you got like. uh, Rain Wilson's in it as an alien. Like Dwight? Yeah, Dwight Schrute. What is the movie made? Like what? Nineties. Nineties. Okay. You had Sam Rockwell, who is always amazing. The king, right there. Yes, I recommend watching Galaxy Quest. It. You know what? I will put it on the list. Yeah, it's it is very much in like a love letter to Star Trek while making fun of it. <laughs> Which I feel like very fair. Yeah. All uh, right. Um. So that's all I had, and I think that's all you have. Pretty much. So let's get into some casting. Mm. There really isn't 
a set idea list I had. Uh, so I feel like we could basically start from. Let's start with let's start with the main cat like the main Enterprise crew. Gotcha. I feel like we should end with with Khan. I would agree. I have a, I have a uh, fun with Khan. So let's start with Captain Kirk. <laughs> Uh, in this movie, in the movie, not not the hamminess in the earlier stuff, but this movie, <laughs> the more Kirk. theory of thinking about Death Kirk, yes. Mm-hmm. For this one, I had a, I had one idea that I feel like might be a bit of a shock. I actually had Connor in the role, C- putting Connor in everything. Oh <laughs> uh, no! Well, here I feel like Connor could definitely pull off. He definitely, definitely the campiness, and if you want to get into that, but I feel like I don't. know, I feel like Connor can definitely turn around and feel like have you know serious moments Kirk does in this movie. But, you know, it's one I thought about a lot. I feel like Kirk's a hard role to cast among people in VTV. Yeah, uh, for mine, I'm going to go back to alumni. I think this is a Miguel Padilla role. Mm. I think he'd pull off the nuance very well. If I met Miguel. And also I have a lot of... So. You'll you'll meet him again. I'm sure. Uh, but, yeah, you'll meet him. And I feel like he would love just to go, Con! <laughs> I feel like that would be him. Yeah, that could be fun. This next choice, though, I feel like is simple. Mm. Uh I'll see if you agree with me. Spock. What, who'd you have in mind for this? I thought about this one a couple times. This is a Josh Mazurkiewicz role. Mm, <laughs> that was definitely, yeah. I feel like Josh is definitely, somebody could play as well, play this role well, and just, I feel like, could do that ending scene pretty perfection. I think you'd do it well, but I think he'd also be able to play Spock's straightness and, like, his, oh. his like, his, like, Rigidness, I should say, mm-hmm. with his dialect and his. I mean, I can't talk movements. about his role yet, but they're the role in the upcoming VTV thing that I feel like, you know, if you get what I mean. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> oh, that. I mean, it played it played the straightness well in that. I feel like it could carry over Spock. Like I can just imagine him being Spock. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, next we have Bones. Bones. <laughs> I had a couple in mind. I think Aiden might play this role well. That Aiden has bones? Yeah. All right, that's an interesting one. Interesting I had Aiden. One. I need to look. I actually I did have a little list that I'm going to pull from. All right, yeah, go a ahead. A little, I was bored, like, about. Personally, one, I think this night. one, this one's a gender swap for me. I think this is a Lexi role. Lexi, the other one I was thinking about, I feel like she could definitely just have bones one-liners. Perfect. Yeah, I feel like she'd have fun with bones, because bones... Bones is very much the one who's like, guys, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, the president of ETV? Yeah. Yeah, like, Absolutely. guys, Spock, Kirk, what are we doing here? Like, You can't hello. be serious, guys. Like, you know. But also play into it at the same time. Oh, definitely. Like, be skeptical, but also be very willing to jump in and, and, and join them. Oh, for sure. Like, she would definitely hop right in. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Savick. Is that her name? <laughs> you got it right. You got it right. Let's I feel go. like, sadly, honestly, you could plug in a, any number of freshmen. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a freshman role. <laughs> I feel like, you know, one of Mia, Hannah, Katie. I feel like I feel like Mia might be the best choice. I think Katie might be the best choice here. Because this, this. this is another Spock-esque role. Cause she, is she Vulcan? She... Because she has the ears. I think... What is it? Is she either... Full Vulcan or half Vulcan, half human? She's something like... She, cause it, she's, it's one of those two. Because she has the Spock tendencies again with playing very rigid for most of the movie. And especially against Kirk, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think I think that either one of them could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, no. Yeah. I feel like... I, I do think Katie might be best to actually think about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, next, let's go with uh, Sulu. Just because he's an iconic character. <laughs> Just I, I say I kind of character only because he's the one person I knew going into this movie. Really? Because I knew George Sakai was in Star Trek. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, it's George Sakai. <laughs> I know you were in Star Trek. It's like, wait, that's what he's famous for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, George Sakai. So this is like the navigator. This is the some. This is the guy who's gonna, you know, keep people on course. And all honesty, doesn't have much in this yeah. movie, but like. George Sakai. It's George Sakai. Uh, honestly, I had actually had you in mind with the role. Me as I feel like navigating. I don't know. I feel like keep me keep on track. I feel like you know you're very well at like getting you know everybody on the same page. I feel like you'd play well in Sulu. Sulu, interesting. Do you have anybody in mind? Uh, I think for this one, I think I put Isabella here. 
I think I Isabella in a Sulu role. Um, cause he, he's another one who's sort of skeptical at some points, but he's always willing to, you know, f- do what he needs to. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess, I thought Sulu had a lot more in this movie because I'm trying to think of what he did in this movie, and now I'm realizing the only reason I remember him is because I kept going, it's George Sakai. <laughs> I will say in the later movie, Sulu definitely has a lot more to do. This I would, one, I would assume he's so. He's kind of backgrounded for more. Time. Well, yeah. Well, because again, it's 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 a Kirk and Savick journey. It's Kirk journey. Savick and mildly Bone the Spock. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Next, you want to do Scotty? We can do Scotty. Why not? I, I not this is actually not based off accent or ability to do that or anything. Just off. I feel like technical wizardry, Demetrius. Techno. Okay. I'm basing it fully off the accent. I think this is the Jacob role. <laughs> Jacob was the one I had in mind, actually. Because Scotty's kind of funny. <laughs> Scotty, yeah. I feel like Jacob can definitely pull off the comedy of it. And mm-hmm. I feel like if you need somebody to know about techno babble, Jacob could do that well. And also pull out some bagpipes when he needs to <laughs> brew in a funeral. Uh, <laughs> um, what's Anybody else? What's the name of the... the you got David and who's, who's his mom? Carol. 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 Such a just... A, normal name yeah. <laughs> carol and david mm. let's just let's wanna, just get this bang these out want to dive into that at the same time here carol and david who's gonna play kirk's i hadn't read that down i thought i did kirk's son mm. see i'm gonna i'm gonna take this as i believe that another alumni i think Allie as carol sure and i think for david we put Tommy in there. I was about to say, Tommy was the only one in mind. <laughs> Willing to fight immediately. <laughs> and I feel like being disowned by a 50-year-old William Shatner, Tommy could definitely pull up. <laughs> yes, Tommy could get beaten by a 50-year-old William Shatner. <laughs> um, any, any other thoughts on that pairing there? Did you have anyone else? I don't, well, I've never met Allie, so I wouldn't know. Uh, it's so crazy that you haven't met these people. I I was away when Lil came back. I apologize. Yeah. You know, it won't, it won't happen again. It won't happen again. Um, uh, Carol, I feel like it's kind of a hard one to the cast to feel like you know, beyond just general nicety and ability to play off Kirk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I think finally, Con. Con. I had two in mind here. Con. I think you'll definitely hit on one. I'm thinking of. So, okay. first person I had in mind for this was Karm. Karm is Khan? Karm is Khan. Okay. Is Khan. And the other one, to gender bend a little bit, was Gianna. Okay. I can see those. Yeah. Gianna was the fun one I had in mind for this. I feel like she could eat that role up and just play it perfectly. Uh, I think my pick for Khan, I don't want to say Connor. We put Connor everywhere. He would do well in this. Though. He would do he well. He would do well. But I think I would put Joe in this role. Ooh, that's interesting. I think put Joe here. I, I feel like he could play the vengeance, <laughs> the connivingness. I feel like he's got the the cunning to to uh be an adversary even though he isn't one that does not come face to face with our heroes here. Mm. I feel like he could be one to play 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 the the vengeance want I don't know. that Khan like does. Joe might be too nice. I don't, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I feel like... What Car- are some roles that he's played? Karm kind of stood out to me, I feel like, as a good choice here. Karm would be good. I feel like he played the manic state of Khan well. Yeah, but Khan also has that stoicness that I feel like Joe can also... Because Khan's got a lot of charisma. Mm-hmm. All right. Con, Con, Con's a villain that you remember because he's very. Would it be possible to like I don't know mash Joe and Carm together like you know <laughs> yeah like like you know what we did Connor for Incredibles I feel like but instead it just well, let's put Carm here let's put Joe there and just let's put them together let's see what we get let's see what we get yeah oh we've got the grandpa from <laughs> Spy Kids <laughs> oops <laughs> well, let's try it again let's try it again let's try it again. Yeah. No, I feel Danny like... Danny Trejo? <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like, though... Joe, I, you can talk, talk me into Joe. You can talk me into Joe. I think... I think I, Khan, Khan's a very mally... It's, it depends on how they play Khan. Mm-hmm. I can see Khan being played many different ways. Mm-hmm. Khan could be played as stoic. Khan could be played as crazy. Mm-hmm. He could be both. Yeah. I think he's a very spectrum-esque role. 
that I feel like anyone could put in. We much. could put anyone in con, and it would just be a different form of con. I feel like take my insanity for marriage pact, and I could get them yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like pretty the, good. Uh, that's a pretty good casting right there. Pretty good. Yeah. I feel like Kirk definitely is one to struggle with, though. Kirk, I think, if you met Miguel, I think you put Kirk uh, there. Yeah. Alright, hey, Miguel, next time I'll meet you, I will think about you for Kirk. Hopefully he's watching this. Mm, I, <laughs> I hope he is. <laughs> Alright, uh, yes, that's I think that's all. Yeah. All so right. Thank you for being on. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you for fun. introducing me to Star Trek after I've put it off for so long. I am glad I have gotten you in this path. Yeah, now I've got to watch every series and movie, so no. I will be in... Live long and prosper. Live, ro- live long and prosper, everybody. Uh, I haven't been able to do this since I was like three. I've been trying to do it since I was like five. Yeah. So, you know. um, yeah. Uh, so currently no plans for our next episode. A little break. We'll s- well, I, we're, we're no, on- no break. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, we're going, f- I mean, we're going on break. We are going on break. Mm-hmm. But for the audience here, we're going to continue on oh, our yeah. schedule. Well, this is coming out when? Uh, this is coming out when we are on break. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we were on a break. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 Whatever you say. Um, but, yeah, the future's up in the air as to who we're going to have on. Potentially Isabella. Isabella will be fun. So. How do you, I'm interested to know what she has for her favorite. I know what she has. Mm. But I don't want to say don't it. Don't spoil it. Because I don't want to spoil it if it doesn't end up being who we do. Because mm-hmm. potentially on the docket, we still got, uh, we got Isabella. I know we got Joe really wants to be on the show. And I know Daniel wants to be on the show. So look out for one of these three. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maybe we'll, alumni. We'll see who comes up. Not yet. Not yet. Though alumni are potentially planned. Mm. Anyway. Logo. <laughs>